We have ignition sequence start. Short distance, high impact. Five, four, three, two, all engines running. Ten questions with Adam Zwar. Big names, great minds. Make yourself a cup of tea. Lift off. We have lift off. Welcome back to 10 Questions. It was an honor to do a recording of my interview with the great Tim Minchin at the Australians in Film headquarters at Rayleigh Studios in Hollywood, the home of Charlie Chaplin. I want to thank Peter Ritchie and the Australians in Film team for making the event possible. It really was such an excellent night, so thank you so much, guys. Now, if you're listening to this interview, I'm guessing you know all about Tim Minchin. But just to recap, Tim's a singer, actor, composer, writer and comedian. He won the Perrier Award for Best newcomer at the Edinburgh Fringe in 2005. He's the composer and lyricist of the Olivia and Tony Award winning show Matilda the Musical. His new musical Groundhog Day, based on the 1993 film, opened in London in 2016, winning his second Olivia Award before going on to Broadway. His recent protest songs, Come Home Cardinal Pell and I Still Call Australia Homophobic, have gone viral. And as an actor, He's appeared in Californication, No Activity, and the new Robin Hood film where he plays Friar Tuck. At the moment, he lives in L.A. with his wife, Sarah, and their two children. And as usual, I started by asking Tim when he was most happy. Um, okay. Well, that's an utterly impossible um, question. <laughs> Um, so, do you know with this podcast you get these questions in advance, which is the worst possible thing because then you're expected to have answers. And my theory with all interviews is to not know anything. But um, I'm quite glad I had these because they're absurdly impossible to answer. Um, I reckon um, I'm happiest on farms, like not doing too much work or like I'm allergic to hay. <laughs> so. Uh, I'm also quite unhappy on farms, uh, but in the absence of allergies or like having to get a rubber band around the testicles of a small sheep, um, <laughs> which is one of the things I used to have to do on my granddad's farm, I'm, I'm pretty happy on a farm, um, just because all the childhood associations. So like when I get back to Perth, I go straight up to York where my folks have a place, and that, that's like that's a switch off. Um, and then I have a memory of the day Casper was born, my second kid, because he was born in England, and in England they go, you're not dying, go home. And so um, Sarah, uh, I didn't have the baby, Sarah did the baby, and, um, and she, I, I don't know what she would say, it was super easy, I reckon. Um, I don't know, you went, in at, you went at five and you're done at 11 or something, it was like a short shift in a bar. And... Um, <laughs> And, uh, and then they just went, you're fine. And we went home and we were sitting in the garden at three o'clock that after, you know, l- literally five hours after the kid was born, we we're sitting in the back garden on one of those perfect London days and your endorphins are just, you know, when you do a human, you just, <laughs> oh, I did a fucking human. <laughs> Smashed it. Um, you say those and words of course, to each other. Yeah. We, just, we just did a human. Yeah, we high five for the human and, and you just... <laughs> You feel so, and obviously there's huge relief that, that, that it worked out, right? And um, I remember that day. We were h- so high, you know, that we took him out for a walk and my dad rang up and said he shouldn't be out amongst the public. He's like 12 hours old. And your, da- your dad's a doctor Yeah, as my well. dad's a doctor, so he, <laughs> it, yeah, he was, it didn't come from nowhere. Um, so they're the cute ones. I, I'm happier on stage than anywhere in my life, like, basically for the same reason it's just endorphins and the other reason i think i'm happy on stage and i think specifically when i'm doing comedy um when you're acting it's more complicated because it's stressful because you have to say something someone else wrote um apparently that's i'm not very experienced but i think that's the way um <laughs> but doing comedy you're you're like a um you're at your best you, mm. you because your fight or flight's kicking in and you're flight flighting you're fighting not flighting not fleeing um and you the, the physical superpowers of being on stage, um, like I remember doing Jesus Christ Superstar and in rehearsal having to climb up the 30 metre rig to go and get dropped down from the roof of this arena thing and, and finding it difficult in rehearsal. And I couldn't understand why it was difficult because during the show, it was, you, you're so filled with 
and I think story, yeah. yeah and I think um, also because you don't have time to think about anything else and I think happiness is probably a state of um, happiness is kind of bullshit obviously because saying you're at your happiness doesn't necessarily mean it's the most fulfilling part of your life because ha- happiness is quite a simple idea um, so actually when someone says when are you most happy I think of all the times um, I, I had nothing else no challenge no, I was challenge free or something yeah yeah and also as you said it before the endorphins are kicking in yeah um, and that's what and what you're saying about the flight and flight and fight in comedy that's why people say they killed yeah exactly or murdered yeah or, you know, got, or you died or you died mm-hmm. yeah. yeah yeah so I think it's hard and it's I think it's something that a lot of performers have trouble with is because they get addicted to that and then they come off stage and it goes away and so they take drugs to make it go longer mm. and and then um, you have waking up the next morning and your kids want Cheerios and you just it feels so <laughs> <laughs> like a like fucking like mundane yeah you know? <laughs> and so you see daddy conscious, on stage yeah. last night it's a, it's a conscious choice to make sure you don't that you, you, you have to choose to value something other than the, the buzz, to identify it as a buzz, not mm. as a truth. And I, I think very early on I learned, like at 15 when I first did, I went, oh, this is going to be bad for me if I don't like wow. identify it as an addiction to the endorphins you get when people are affirming your choices. Mm. Mm. No, that's, <laughs> at 15, that's, that's very good. I, you know, there's a lot of comedians in their 50s still working that out. Um, Tim, quick second question is: mm-hmm. Who would you like to apologise to, and why? Um, most answers come back to Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I'm quite a nice husband in a way, a bit useless. But I, I mostly want to apologise to her because she's had to have sex with me for so long. <laughs> <laughs> like, no, she hasn't had to. Like, I'm not making her, but there's certainly a lot of pressure. Um, I mean, it's consensual but like <laughs> as a as an emotional arm twisting goes on um no i i mean since we since we were children she's had to, i mean we were 17 when mm. i first touched her genitals oh. and <laughs> and i uh and i and she, i've been asked trying to do it for 25 years and it must be awful for her it's a beautiful story <laughs> If I came up to me all the time and started groping around, I'd be furious. <laughs> it's just disgusting. Um, but I was thinking a bit about this, and you know, this is sort of this will go too long, but all my answers will. And uh, sorry, I'll do shorter ones. No, it's, it's but good. you know, um, I don't want to get into marriage plebiscite all the time because in this crowd, it's obviously such a fucking crazy thing. Um, but I'm, I'm not really going to talk about it. But I was thinking, I've been thinking every now and then, I've, I've hooked up on Facebook with these two really good friends I had when I was a kid who were from Malaysia, came to Australia in like year three, twins. Really good friends with both of them, mostly one for some years. And then, you know, like, and um, I think a bit in this environment of identity politics and people like me, white entitled boys private school Perth grew up in the widest city in the world the learning that you're having to constantly do and I've thought a lot about the language the um, things we call them the racial epithets like yeah. it's devastating to me but they were meant with absolute fondness and it received as far as I know with fondness but it makes me cringe mm-hmm. and my kids would I hope wouldn't get that wrong but in my folks days they kind of corrected us rather than did a, a top down political education you know whereas I say to my kids you know this is what you have to know mm. Um, mm. and it makes me sick and, and the kids with special needs our schools really had this amazing special education department and, they, and we had nicknames for those kids and I just feel sick about it um, and I, I wonder if um, those two guys and I I haven't spoken to them for years if we sat down and had a drink whether I'd feel compelled to say did because surely even though they understood it to be fond I suppose surely it made them feel othered Mm. you know so I was thinking a bit about that and then thinking about the conservative um element of Australia that is so angry Mm. at political correctness and so and and they're like "Ah, why can't we just Mm. not be politically correct all the time it's like well what are you losing by just 
listening to what hurts other people and stopping. Like, what, why, why don't you just give it up? Yeah. And, 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 and then being they're so angry that they're being called bigots that they're going to vote no just to piss us off. Yeah. Which is like an evil thing to do. Mm. For someone to write to me and go, because I did a song, you're going to stop two of my dear friends and their kids having a beautiful day. Yeah. I mean, it's evil. It's gross. But they, they're so angry. And I've done comedy where I've said the wrong thing. I've, I've been called out by trans people, black people, obese people. And I was never going, ah, but I was trying to do irony. I was trying to do mm. edgy. I was trying, and I, I, didn't, I wasn't educated enough. And I got called out. And it hurt sometimes, really hurt to listen. Sometimes I was like, fuck no, I'm doing irony. Yeah, and yeah, then yeah. I'd listen and I'd listen and I learned and I stopped. Yeah. And the joy of coming from Perth, West Australia and getting so educated by the world. Why don't people say... Anyway, so I've gone from... I, because you do... <laughs> you do, you do, you do have to... Kids, apo- yeah. You do have to fucking... Anyway, so I don't suppose you can go through your whole life apologising for every time you didn't already know the thing you later knew, but... Um, and it's, it's hard to be uh, educated in public. Like, you saw it with Bill Maher recently when he used the N-word, and, and never is there a kind of a more liberal... Uh, even tempered, even minded person than Bill Maher, yet he's just said he had to sit there and like take shit for half an hour as one person after another came out and, and called him on it. And then, I mean, it's all, look, the left is cray cray. <laughs> we are crazy. We are putting political uh, identity politics ahead of, you know, don't even, well, above everything, above, above the hope of trying to bring society with us, you know, Mm. not every human in Alabama can know everything there is to know about intersexual, intersectional African-American trans politics. I mean, you read as much as you can, but even me, I died in the wool, you know, social justice freak. I can't, you know, we are, we expect a lot. Mm. And I, you know, I, I called people who don't want gay people to get married bigoted cunts on the internet and I get the pleasure of right wing columnists calling me a hate monger and I don't know part of me gets that I I mean I just do that to get a laugh and to encourage other lefties to vote but um, we got to get better at not and being how, so hysterical yeah and how do you f- feel when, the, when a, a torrent comes down on you a torrent of like right wing abuse I feel awful, but I, I also, well, post Pell, I, when I, it always shocks me because I think surely this, or this is like an iPhone and a stupid parody. Like I've never stooped to a parody in my life. I don't do song parodies, <laughs> but I, I, it's such a fucking good idea. <laughs> um, and it wasn't my idea. It came from Jeremy Irvine years ago. He said, we should, he was an advertising guy. I've got this idea, I still call Australia homophobic. It sat around and he kept wanting to make it a huge thing with lots of celebs and I'm like, it's not going to work like that, man. It's got to be low status. But it went... And I... I've... It... But I'm, I'm, I know it's coming now. But I still find it very, very frustrating because the people who write columns about me are disingenuous, intellectually limited people. Mm. I'm sorry. Yeah, but no. And, it, and, and I have to resist the urge to, you know... The guy whose name I won't name because it just encourages him that rhymes with vault. He asks me on his stupid show all the time. And I'm like, I'm not going on your show to get people to listen to your show. But I want to. Yeah, I yeah. want to get in there so bad. You know? dreams of fantasies. I do. I yeah, fantasize yeah. all the time about tearing. War, war gaming, Andrew Bolt. Yeah. T- oh, Bolt. Oh, Bolt. Oh, Bolt. 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 <laughs> uh, Question three. The Americans here just going, what the <laughs> fuck's going on? Gays can't marry? What the fuck? <laughs> it's 2017. I'm trying to think of, yeah, it's kind of, um, what's that What's that Fox News guy who always looks kind of confused? Um, I'm just trying to give the Americans a, 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 a bolt equivalent. Well, he's... he's all right, uh, it's not, all right, yeah, Tucker Wilson. Tucker Carlson. Tucker Carlson. Tucker Carlson. Um, Tucker question, Wilson's also a Tucker Wilson. <laughs> My question three, what is your greatest regret? Um, well, regret's a bit like happiness. It's a bit sort of silly, silly idea, really. Um, but it's, for the first time in my life, I've got a definite one, which is moving here. 
<laughs> uh, it's the only. It's the huge. It's been a huge fuck up. Um, but you know, but that's a, even that. That's a good example of why the why the notion of regret is absurd because I wouldn't have met you and I wouldn't be in fucking Robin Hood and I wouldn't have met all the friends I met and I wouldn't have had the years I've had and maybe if we'd stayed in London my kid was hit by a car you know like Mm. it's absurd because of the exponential impossibility of gathering uh, of getting your head around the infinite other pathways but um but I spent four years eschewing all other work to do a project that just got trashed so I don't I mean I can't for someone like me who just wants to make shit and wants to work all the time and for whom saying no to the five musicals and the five acting jobs and that was like, it doesn't matter because I'm doing this thing. I said I'd do it. Totally dedicated to it. I'm fucking doing it. Damn. You know, it's a fucking... So it's the first time I've ever gone, I just, that was just the wrong move, as it turns out. As it turns out, in hindsight. Wow. So there's no point regretting it because at the time it was the right choice. You know? Yeah, yeah. But, um... And need I say out loud, I'm the luckiest, most privileged fuck in the world, so it's all in the context of my own absurdly <laughs> lucky, privileged life. I mean, I'm not, you know... Not, Before his work, that's, you know... Yeah, it's kind of hard to get your head around, actually. Yeah. People go, oh, yeah, and I lost a movie, and I'm like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to say the word animation, and you can go and find out what that means like hours over a feather you know like just out over the color of what the dirt looks like in the kimberly over the way eucalyptus leaves hang and that's just the fucking background environment you know oh god yeah yeah and all the voice people coming in and yeah 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 i mean that's the least of it i auditioned by the way but... yeah, yeah well there's another regret yeah yeah to the list. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, um, you, you're on my list. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I had all these. <laughs> yeah. Okay, just, yeah. just go back to the Blackmore's ads. And... <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's um. But I and 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 then I and then on top of that, Groundhog Day's not done its thing. So um, it's been the worst year for me by a long, long shot, work-wise. But. But it was nominated. It got, it got, oh, it got, it got a lot of critical acclaim. acclaim and, and it's yeah. just that, unfortunately, yeah. when you take something to Broadway, there's only one measure that matters, right. and that is, did you lose $10 million or not? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, so, so what I think about all that when I'm feeling good, I mean, it's knocked me. It's knocked my confidence and my ability to create and stuff, but I'm, I'm getting out of it. And um, I'm, so, as I say, obviously, I'm not, this is not a discussion... I, um, about pity I just but in terms of trying to contextualise that because all, all of us have problems and they're all first world problems um, but um, is is that I go if I die and the worst thing that ever happened to me is I spent a few years making a fucking singing animal movie that didn't go and one or two of my musicals didn't weren't hits you know that's not a, that's absurd it's absurd I know it's absurd but yeah shouldn't yeah. have moved to LA <laughs> Um, I try and do these questions with a, with a narrative. So, um, what would you? The, the fourth question is: What would you still need to do to feel you've lived a satisfactory life? See animal movie. Yeah. <laughs> no, never again. What What would I have to do to feel I've lived a satisfactory mm-hmm. life? Would you have an answer to that? It's a. I, I yeah. Um, <laughs> it's a funny one, isn't it? Because get a good night's sleep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> Um, just get off the heroin. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, you know that brings me down. <laughs> I I think um, I don't. The, the, so back to my privilege and luck. Um, this every the the last ten years have allowed me to do things, meet people, be a part of things that I never would have even tilted at. You know, like. People go, oh, I always dreamt of being on Broadway. And I'm like, really? <laughs> what did your parents tell you? Because my parents told me, like, you're not special. <laughs> you're like, yeah, yeah. like, not in a bad way, but yeah. it's how I bring my kids up too. It's like, like, when you grow up in Perth, there's no ladder no. that ends in Broadway. No one's ever written, a, from Perth's ever written a musical that's gone to Broadway. You know, it's um, co-written a musical. 
So there's no, it's abs- it's crazy. I've already done so much, mm. like like not even in the realm of what I thought I'd get to do. Um, when I was a teen, I'd like go maybe one day I'm playing a piano bar and they'll pay me and <laughs> you know because um, you know and your expectations kept changing. Yeah, yeah. And it was a very interesting thing that and a and a, a confidence building thing and a slightly disconcerting thing is that you keep thinking you're going to hit the geniuses. Mm. And I, I, when I moved to Melbourne from Perth, I went, well, now I, I, I immediately got in a cover band and stayed in it for three years because I thought, well, I'm not going to be able to write theatre in Melbourne because Melbourne, all the best theatre writers in Australia will be here. Yeah. And, and I won't be able to, you know, I did audition to play in a piano bar at the casino and didn't get the job. And <laughs> um, so I did this cover band and they were great. Thank yeah. Thank Christ for those boys. What did you do? Just play keyboards. Yep. They let me sing a couple of times and just went, yeah, Tim, you might want to, because they'll be like, Jeremy Spoken. And they, <laughs> they were very much like, um, <laughs> kind of Holy Grail, like just like footy, yeah. like like the band that you have at the footy club. It's very masculine. Fucking great singers, yeah, yeah. these two brothers. Amazing singers and musos. But What's that, super. Ch- chisel? Or yeah, like a bit of chisel, like all top 40 Church. and oh, stuff. Yeah, right. But if it was a bit gay, they'd be like, I'm oh, not doing that one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But I'd like wear my tight pants. Um, but yeah, I, I, uh, so, so I would, if I die tomorrow, it'd be sad for the kids to be all right. Um, it'd be all right as far as achieving goals has, but I would, I was talking to Elise at lunch yesterday. Poor Elise had, we had lunch for two hours and I debriefed her about my life. So she's heard all this yesterday. Um, um, but we had breakfast, even though it was lunchtime. Um, <laughs> I just feel like I want to paint the picture, okay? Like, it's fucking detail matters. It's the big print. Um, I, I would really like to be able to get more peaceful. I'd like to, because we're moving home at Christmas. We always were going to um, move home when Violet got to 11, you know, got to middle school. Um, and part of my mission is to just calm the fuck down and stop feeling like, okay, all right, I've done that. That's not enough. I've got to do... I've got to fucking show them that I can... Whoever them is. I want to show them. Yeah, yeah. All yeah. the agents who said no. Oh, no. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's re- revenge art. Yeah. And we, yeah. without them, you wouldn't... Without that burn, mm. that competitive bullshit burn, you, you wouldn't have got done what... All of us wouldn't get done what we've got done, but um, it's tiring. It's tiring like, for yeah. Sarah, you know. That's true. That and the sex... And that's oh. it. Oh, it's, don't worry, it's all tiring. Right. Sometimes I'll like lift something and right. she gets some energy back in the equation, but <laughs> mostly I'm a sucker. Question five is who is the person who most influenced you and how? It's you, Adam. Yeah. <laughs> um, Apart from me, too. Yeah, well, <laughs> um, well, actually, I'm, I'm bad at that question as well. It's funny, actually, I hadn't thought of it, but just off the end of that last question, I guess the people who said no are the biggest influences, aren't they? That's true. Yeah. Like, like, not, not, not that I have a like. I had a music teacher who said you'll never make it, and mm. you know, but, um, and and actually, all the rejections didn't drive me so much. But I think, um, I think the elusive ephemeral them whatever it is the ghostly them that you're showing mm. who don't have a face for me well that's um, the, the, the thing for me is that with uh aaron sorkin had the cocaine whereas <laughs> i've got the the people who slighted me mm. that's what my that's what actually fires me yeah and uh, <laughs> which is very small and terrible no i think and i think it's a dude <laughs> thing i think it's a bit of a dude problem not not that i'm saying there's only two genders but if there were it might be a dude problem um <laughs> Um, but I, I, you know, that's the kind of obtuse answer. The sentimental and true answer is my big brother, probably, because, um, you know, I can name Lennon, what did, what did Lennon, he... Lennon McCartney and T.S. Yeah. Eliot and Shakespeare. Um, <laughs> what did your brother do? He's, what uh, he do? he's just, he's just, uh, um, become the CEO of a new amalgamation of three not-for-profit home care companies in West Australia. He's a fucking brilliant, lovely kind guy but what he did was be my big brother and i'm one of four and we, none of us uh we, we we all have this relationship where we all uh, aspired to do what the others were doing we didn't have a like well i'm gonna go my own way we're like we're gonna be part of that club so mm-hmm. everything my brother did i did 
and from playing hockey, we did the same degree. We did uh, theatre at school, and I just did what he did because he he wasn't cool, by the way. He's just my big brother. He he wasn't like a cool guy that I was revered. But um, but the main thing he did is when I gave up piano at eleven or whatever, twelve. Um, he'd be like, he loved music. He had posters. Of, he got um, Australian. It's the fucking magazine. Rolling Stone, Australian Rolling Stone, and every do you remember every month it had a just a double page yeah. fold out of Kirkamane or whatever, yeah. rip it out, stick it on his wall. And my baby sister was eleven years younger than him when she was two. She could name them all because he'd sit in the room and go, "Who's that?" And she'd go, "Yeah, <laughs> Kirkamane, yeah, That's Michael funny. Hutchins, yeah, yeah." yeah. <laughs> um, and and uh, I didn't really care for music so much. Yeah, right. Um, but he was like, "Come on, I want to work out." I've worked out this Crowded House song, but it's got that keyboard bit. Can you... And I had this little Casio, and I'd work out a little beginning of... Da, 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 beginning of Light My Fire, or whatever. And so without Dan, I, I just don't think I'd be a muso. And then he would write songs, and I'd write lyrics, because I was always into poetry and stuff. Um, I mean, originally, he, he'd have a, he had a band, and I came and played keyboards for his band, and then I'd write the lyrics, and then I started taking over writing the music, and he ended up... You know, by the time I started getting the paper, he was my guitarist brother Dan, and it was a <laughs> it was a family joke. But he was beautiful. He never he never went. Oh, it's my, he he just went. Oh, you're better. You know, at writing the songs, and so he played and sang harmonies until we wow. left. Till I was 26. Till after I was married, and then and after I left Perth, I never found another Dan. I never found my bandmate, which is why I'm a fucking comedian instead of a pop star. Did, would would he play with you? <laughs> would he would he play with you again? Would would you actually have him in anything if you? Yeah, I yeah. got him on stage. I've got him on stage. I, I um at the um, with the Adelaide Symphony Orchestra. I got him on to play Dark Side. I got him on the um, steps of the Sydney Opera House with half my extended family um, a couple of years ago. It's unbelievable. I'll show it to you. I've got footage and everything. Wow. Yeah. I mean, he's he doesn't play enough anymore, and his voice is pretty reedy. And but uh, yeah, no, he's he's and he's proud beautiful of you. music. You know. he, he, does he talk to you about you? Is he proud of you? Yeah, he's proud of me. We don't, we don't have a family that says that shit particularly. No, but yeah, no, no. Uh, at a pinch, yeah, he's yeah. <laughs> he's huge. Like he came to England to see the opening of Groundhog Day, and like at the end he was like shaking. Oh wow! Yeah, wow. Because he was just so overwhelmed by, it. and because I stole one of his riffs. <laughs> No, he's a good man. He's a very kind, kind guy. As well. I so did not know that was coming. That yeah. was beautiful. Okay. When was the last time you cried and why? Oh, this afternoon. Uh, we, watching. Um, um, Zach Hilditch's End of the World movie filmed in Perth. Someone's worked with Zach in this room. Uh, yeah. With Steve Curry and. No, no right. um, oh, the Nathan, I don't know the boy, Nathan. Nathan, Nathan yeah, 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 Nathan. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I, did, I didn't know him, and um, and that gorgeous kid. And there's just a um, bit where the, the he finally gets the kid spoiler um, to the dad, and the dad's dead, and, and she puts flowers on the dad's chest. And I cry in movies. Mm. Like I've never been more emotionally destroyed than watching Marley and Me on a plane. You know, <laughs> I, I, I I cry easily in movies, and I really don't ever want to. I don't look for boom shadows in movies. I, I, I just don't have that problem. In the theatre too, I, don't, I can go and see a school play and I have no issue with going, oh, no, I'm not, I'm not analysing this, I'm mm. watching it. It's the, my favourite thing in the world is going to watch a story and I consciously sit down and go, OK, I'm, I'm going to receive whatever, the, you know, like yeah, I, it's yeah. a real thing. I go on about it all the time and I'm so angry at critics and audience members who go and go, right, what do you got? Like, you go to the theatre and take the fucking offer. And it might not be everything for you, but the attitude with which you watch art is like, ah. um, I, I'm really naive and innocent um, about that stuff. I'm quite naive. That's why this LA thing has just destroyed me, because I just thought, I oh, know, if, if you're kind and work hard, yeah. you, you know, like, fuck. Not in LA, mate. Uh, no, no. <laughs> well, it has. It's been, yeah, it's been... Like, I got to 41 as an optimist, so that's not bad. It's got to be a record. Um, <laughs> Um, but um, yeah, so quite, and I'm writing a song at the moment which I quite like. I'm I'm trying to write an album. That's what I need to do before I die. Um, finish this fucking record. But I'm writing a song called "If This Plane Goes Down," and it's it's like it's it's quick. It goes, "If this plane goes down, I hope that I'll be one of the cool ones. <laughs> Will I have the nerve to play the clown as this plane goes down?" It's like it's oh, it's wow. it's like nice. But it, then it says. Um, 
Um, so if it ends in fire and fuel, please tell the kids I kept my cool. So it's got a little bit of, and then at the and then and so I made myself cry writing about what <laughs> what I'd tell my kids if I went down in a fire. That's fucking ridiculous, but yeah. So twice today. That's pretty cool. <laughs> I'm in a vulnerable state. <laughs> I'm super fucking tough as well. <laughs> David Duchovny, David Duchovny's got this thing where he says that if there's someone more famous than him on the plane, it won't go down. He's quite confident that it won't go down. <laughs> I love that. Mm. Um, but when it's him, he thinks this is about the level. <laughs> this is about the level that goes. I'm like the big bumper. Well, yeah, in that example. This is a joke. And also on the plane was Adam Zwa. Yeah, yeah. In the second yeah. 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 I don't know. That maybe that's what you need to do before you die is get to a point where you'd out headline Dave to coffee <laughs> on a plane. Just wait. He'll be dead soon. <laughs> he won't. He's very well and lovely guy. <laughs> um, Spent a lot of time naked with that guy. You have? Yeah. Because of, um, yeah, yeah. There's a lot of nakedness. Yeah. yeah. Just like scenes where everyone's having sex and doing drugs. Californication. So Tim was on Californication. And... Uh, Gary Shandling also spent a lot of time naked with David Duchovny because in there's a famous episode of Larry Sanders' show where Ooh. David Duchovny's got a crush on Gary oh, Shandling. Really? On Larry Sanders. Yeah, yeah. Poor Gary. Um, yeah, so, sorry. That's uh, uh, bringing that up. So it's another reason why you should cry. Um, <laughs> the I think it's the seventh question, uh, Tim, is what Shit. is your current state of mind? <laughs> oh, I didn't write that one down. Oh, oh maybe I did. Um... Right, you know, I've, I've been worse, more down than I've ever been, but but with an awareness that that's because I'm the happiest person ever. Like I'm very very lucky with my mental health and stuff. So I've been flat, but um, um, and I think ah, oh, the world's fucked as well. So that seems a pity to me. <laughs> um, I think it's really. I think whatever challenges you have in life at the moment are now paired with this mm. anxiety not not just because of uh the imbecile in the white house but um because of how much we consume it you know so so i don't know what to do about that because i'm completely addicted to looking um and you feel somehow socially irresponsible for not knowing mm. which is bullshit by the way but even if you're at a party and you don't know you're made to feel stupid, if you don't know the latest thing, um, if you go to a party and you don't know North Korea, just to explode a hydrogen bomb, whatever, you, you're like, Ooh, and people are like, didn't you read it? But I... Um, so it's... Yeah. Yeah. I, I, but, you know, I'm obsessed by the art I make, so losing larrikins and Groundhog Day closing it enough without the uh, global existential crisis. Uh, can, you, can you write your way out of depression? That's the thesis at the moment. I, I, I'm better in the last couple of weeks. Like, again, it's all context. I'm, I'm, I'm good. I'm, I'm feeling... Um, I also just had flu for a couple of weeks. So it's like, oh. I, I find writing... writing do you know, I think I was saying to you yesterday as well, Elise, it's like what I feel like this country has done is take my magic powers away from me. Mm. And I know that's bullshit. That's a bullshit, terrible story to tell yourself. But it's like I came here like this little leprechaun with all these magic powers where I would like be funny and creative and people would listen to my ideas and say, that's great. And I'd just be like, blah, blah, blah. Um, and I could write a song and juggle and i just feel like they're going fuck off and just like <laughs> just like like something out of harry potter like sucked my mojo yeah. out of me and knowing that that's all bullshit it's like a journey of going what the fuck do i do to get my mojo back um and so writing I, i've written two songs i'm quite happy with in the last four weeks which is I, I'm also like a. I usually write really, really fast, so I'm like, "Fuck, four songs in four weeks, Jesus!" At this rate, I'll I won't write an album for three months. Um, <laughs> uh, but you know, because like Matilda and Grandma Day, like ten weeks, you know, whatever. Wow. And so I'm, but the fact that I like those two songs has been a huge thing for me, and 
of course I have my children and my family and yeah like um so the the luckiness buzzes away over the top of it all of course it sounds so ridiculous to even discuss it I have to reiterate all the time that I have the best life of anyone but, I know. But you know, I, I I feel I have good luck and bad luck city, cities. Mm-hmm. Um, Brisbane is a terrible city for me. <laughs> Just so you know. I've had great times in oh, Brisbane. Yeah, right. Okay. Maybe we're like yeah, yeah. <laughs> two halves of a club. No. Um, yeah, Brisbane really got me. Uh, Melbourne was good. Melbourne was good. Perth's been good. Perth, I, I had a good time. Perth's been all right yeah. to me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, London's my town. Yeah, right. It's where everything clicked. Yeah. In Edinburgh. But, um, uh, yeah, I'm pretty well, really. Like, I feel like I'm... Like, I always feel like... Oh, fuck, okay, come on. Like, I, I, I have I have this sort of, like, um, fighting thing. Like, I, yeah. I run a lot of distance, and I, I have this, like, doesn't matter how tired you are in the last K, you run... Oh, that bullshit. My dad always gave me running metaphors because we both love running. And it's yeah, like, yeah. on the uphill, you, that's when you win, man. And yeah, so I got yeah. that bullshit going around my head, oh, too. So totally. Like, yeah. Me, too. A lot, of, uh, a lot of running in my life. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> running from things. Running away yeah, from yeah, your yeah. coke. <laughs> your heroin um, habit. Hey, <laughs> question eight. What do you consider your greatest achievement? Um... <laughs> I told Sarah that I had to answer that question. She said, well, you meant to say your children. And I'm like, they're clearly your achievement. Mate. I don't, I didn't make a, I didn't birth them. And I, didn't, I don't look after them nearly all the time. Uh, um, my children are Sarah's greatest. No, my children, Sarah's achievement with our children is the greatest achievement in our family. Um, no, I, th- I think, getting to 41 as an optimist pretty good achievement by which i mean i'm so i'm proud of how i treat people actually and that's another part of my devastation with this town i i just don't think of and i've never hurt anyone you know Mm. and i'm proud of that and um I don't think I have. Obviously, I'm sure there's people who are like, well, you didn't say hi to me, and, and I do feel whatever. But I, I don't, you know, I don't think you'd find a, a sound engineer or a lighting tech or a chorus member. Or, I don't think you'd find people who go, oh, no, he, was, he shouted. Or, like, mm. you know, um, and I'm proud of how good I got at piano. That's good. But I don't think I'm very good, but given that I didn't have many lessons, I'm like, wow, that took a lot of fucking work, and I'm all right about, mm-hmm. you know. Mm. Like, I'd love to be much better, but... Um, <laughs> Sometimes I think that's... I, I play the piano every day and I think, how cool is it that I can just play the piano? Yeah. Like, I really like it. Yeah, it's... Uh, you know, for someone who never learned any musical instruments like me, I, yeah. it's, I, I find it a wonder and I wish I'd done it, so... Yeah, it's, you know. I know it's a privilege and it's it's so lucky that in my teens I just didn't want to do my homework and I just did that all the time. Yeah, right. Yeah. And so when your brother... When you actually resigned or re- retired from piano playing at yeah. 11... Whatever, I'd, and grade then, three, and, yeah. All right, and then so when did you actually resume? Oh, like maybe I closed it for six months or a year. Oh, right, or okay, yeah. okay. And he encouraged you to get back on. Yeah, yeah, and I just started working stuff out by year and it suited me better. Yeah. That's, that's great. Yeah. Um, the second last question, probably my mm-hmm. favourite question, who would you want on your side in a battle and why? <laughs> Yeah, how do people answer that question? Well, it's this kind of if if they're in they're in the business, you know, they, they oh, might right. say on a, in a comedy battle, I want this person. Right. You know, in an actual battle, I yeah. want this person. Well, in a in an artistic battle, I I get I get to have and what would want always Matthew Watchers, who directed Matilda and Groundhog Day. Oh, wow! Just because he's the most brilliant theatrical mind I've met, and a lovely man, and. Um, and just staunch, you know, just like, like he's always defended. We argue a bit, but he, you know, in the face of big, powerful producers mm. who dropped out five weeks before opening and took their money with them, um, who were trying to tell us what to do. Where um, did you meet? Did you meet in England? Or? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah he, right. came, he, the Royal Shakespeare Company came to me, and he yeah. was the director before he was attached to Matilda. He built Matilda, you know. He's the architect of both those shows. People think director, he tells them where to stand, but he built those shows. And he, his lack of acknowledgement on Broadway is another thing I'm furious about. But, um, uh, yeah, so um, Stephen Fry, I've, I've had arguments, intellectual arguments, with Fry on my side, that's good. Wow. Uh, you know, if you're at a dinner party... 
arguing with someone about AI like I was. Um, and Stephen you got Fry Fr- on your side, that's good. Holy moly. <laughs> I had Dawkins sitting there, Fry sitting here, and Dawkins had just had a stroke, actually, so he was quiet. He was still, like, totally engaged, but he was just not as fiery. Fry, Fry just gets like, that's absolute nonsense! Like, just, like, he's, but he's brilliant, and he thinks nearly all the same things as me, so, well, times ten. Um, but, um, you know, if it was a physical battle or a battle of egos, probably Conor McGregor, I think, that'd be good. Um, but, uh, the, again, the sentimental but true answer, and this is super sentimental, but this is what happens when you give me the questions in advance and I'm writing ballads, um, <laughs> is that the thing I feel about um, life and this few years, of, you know, this year especially, where it's just like, fuck, and I've been so lucky, and then you hit these things is that yeah and the privilege of having a family is that your family like sarah and i have been together since we were kids and and now we've got kids and and we've always even though we're totally different people and do totally different things felt like it's well you've got your you're facing the world together you know mm-hmm. so you, like and that with my and with my extended my family i grew up in with how close i'm with my siblings it's like they are they are my you do sometimes feel it's like the fucking world's coming at you and they're your, you got a team. They're your people. That's your team yeah, without yeah. a doubt. And my kids feel like part of my team as well. It's, it's good. It's why, you know, I think to do a little flip, the, one of my great achievements and, and, uh, and it's, it's not hard because I was very lucky with who I met getting through the last 20 years when we, we went through such a change yeah. geographically and, career-wise and stuff and to have um, my marriage is pretty good achievement and mm. and the payoff now is that when your back's to the wall and you're facing outwards you got your family standing next to you, you know? that's brilliant yeah yeah um and the last question is what would you like your last words to be <laughs> well my last words are on the public record because i have a bit about it <laughs> And if any of you cared about my work, you'd know. <laughs> uh, my last words are, who's the world going to revolve around now? <laughs> oh, brilliant. Ladies and gentlemen, Tim Minchin. <laughs> How'd it go? How long was I? Was that a record? You have 41 minutes. Each. We have ignition sequence start. Short distance, high impact. Five, four, three, two... All engines running. Ten questions with Adam Joir. Big names, great minds. Make yourself a cup of tea. Liftoff. We have liftoff. 